notice. And I will officially welcome you to Talking Data Equity for Friday, November 10th. It is good to see you. And what, what Talking Data Equity is, is an informal 50, 55 minutes uh, that the We All Count team and the We All Count team is a project for equity in data that we host almost every single Friday. Uh, and it is a space for anybody in any sector in any country who's working on improving the equity in their data project to come and join, listen to stories, share stories, ask for resources, share resources. And remember that you aren't alone, that we are in this together. And sometimes talking data equities are wide open. We do an ask me anything kind of situation. Sometimes we talk about really specific topics, like maybe a technical topic, like how to do mathematical Bayesian analysis or how to uh, design a survey question to collect sexual orientation data. And sometimes we have a special guest. And this week is that kind of week. We have a special guest and a special guest that I have been looking forward to. And I was so glad that it was this week, not last week, because it would have broken my heart. <laughs> Our special guest um, is uh, Dr. Gladys Rowe, and I was lucky enough to be able to spend some time with Dr. Rowe recently uh, at, a, at a gathering and just was really impacted and affected and made smarter <laughs> by listening to the stories and the insights uh, that Gladys shares. And so I asked if they would come uh, to Talking Data Equity, and they have, and today's the day. Um, Gladys is a Muskego Ininu, pretty close, but not great, uh, <laughs> sorry, a Swampy Creek person who also holds relations with ancestors from Ireland, England, Norway, and Ukraine. She is a member of Fox Lake Cree Nation in Northern Manitoba, she currently resides on the occupied lands of the Duwamish and the Squamish people in Washington state. Gladys is a scholar, a filmmaker, a poet, an author, a facilitator, a researcher, and an evaluator. She takes an interdisciplinary approach to her work and loves to think inside the circle when it comes to transforming the futures that we are living in. And I will answer your question right now and say, yes, uh, when we put up the video later today, we'll also put up links to um, Dr. Rowe's website, uh, a, a few of the highlights of Dr. Rowe's work. And there's a podcast, which is very, very useful called Indigenous Insights. So I will leave it at that because um, I don't want to take any more of the uh, airtime. And I'm going to, in fact, turn it over to Gladys. And uh, she's going to share with us a little bit, a few stories. And then we'll have a bit of a conversation. And for the first part, when Gladys is sharing, we're going to ask that you stay muted uh, or keep your microphones off. And uh, then once we get uh, partway into uh, the conversation, we'll open it up for discussion and anybody who wants to uh, turn their microphones on and come have a conversation and ask some questions uh, are warmly encouraged to do that. And at any point starting now and for the rest of the hour, uh, if you want to ask a question or make a comment or say hello in the chat, you feel free to do that. You don't have to wait for that. So Gladys, thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you, Heather, so much for the invitation. Uh, we were sharing before everyone jumped on just how excited I think we both were for uh, this conversation. Uh, it's been the highlight that's gotten me to the end of the week. So really grateful to be here. Uh, as Heather shared uh, a little bit of an introduction uh, about who I am and some of the relations that I bring to my work, um, and I'll also be sharing some resources. Uh, so there's lots of links, lots of resources that will be shared throughout our time. So um, 
to talk a little bit about kind of where I'm showing up in this space and talking about um, my work in data equity, I really want to share a little bit about the foundational um, kind of assumptions that I have about the work that I do. So I work in the area of Indigenous evaluation, but as you can tell by my introduction, I, uh, I feel like that's a really more expansive area than the really um, uh, boxed in definition of how people understand evaluation or research uh, and really take that interdisciplinary approach. So for me, um, I'll share a little bit about what I understand Indigenous evaluation to be. I'll share some of the stories and experiences that I've had as well. So Indigenous evaluation for me is really uh, about a significant commitment to decolonization and Indigenous resurgence. So those are two key aspects for me of what Indigenous evaluation means. It's about creating a space where Indigenous voices are heard and are prioritized and Indigenous voices drive the work. So those are some key elements for um, my definition of Indigenous evaluation. And it's really about ensuring that Indigenous peoples our worldviews, which are multiple, depending on the lands and the languages and the relationships where we live, that, you know, Indigenous isn't one pan uh, approach, but it's rather really grounded and rooted in place and space and, and language. So it's about ensuring that Indigenous worldviews are guiding all of the decisions that are made about what it means to work in partnership in an evaluation. And you could transfer that from my perspective to things like research, to things like policy development. It's really a fundamental understanding about how to work well um, and in a good way with Indigenous communities and nations. So um, some other aspects to bring into this definition of Indigenous evaluation from my perspective is that it is deeply subjective because of um, the ontology, the ways of knowing, being, and doing of Indigenous nations, it, it must be subjective. And it must acknowledge that there's multiple ways of knowing, being, and doing, and informing the design and implementation of any of the work that we're doing, which means <clears throat> that principles such as relational accountability are really key, which means that we are um, I am accountable to the work that I'm doing and the, and, and the project is accountable to me. And there's multiple layers of accountability that isn't only uh, a funder or a reporting up or out process uh, around accountability. So it's an expansive definition of accountability that's rooted in relationship. It's about shared decision-making in a way that actually moves the locus of power back into indigenous communities realms. Uh, it's about data sovereignty. And so, uh, you know, I think I'm in a space where people are really excited to talk about, uh, you know, that kind of um, uh, idea where who owns the data, who has the power to, um, you know, in Canada, we have OCAP, so ownership, control, access, possession, uh, which really gets to the some of the concepts around data sovereignty for Indigenous peoples and ownership. So Indigenous evaluation really then, it, looks to transform the way that knowledge about our communities is produced. It's, I, I talk about evaluation as one of the mechanisms of knowledge production, research being another uh, mechanism of knowledge production, and the way that those kinds of information about who we are as Indigenous nations um, have pro been produced in the past from a Euro-Western lens have really perpetuated kind of where we are today. There's a lot of inequity, um, you know, in the, in the uh, impacts of colonial uh, disruptions continue to, um, to be witnessed in, in what we see today. And so Indigenous evaluation is about disrupting that um, knowledge production mechanism and really uh, looking to ensure the success of generations to come in a way that's grounded in our own understanding as Indigenous nations about what, what is important for us. And so that sounds probably uh, a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> There's a lot of elements there, uh, but one of the pieces, one of the um, uh, one of the elements that I'd like to share with you, I've been doing this work for since about 2008, and if you do listen to my podcast, uh, there's 21 episodes of Indigenous Insights and Evaluation podcast where I sit in conversation with um, 
other practitioners, other Indigenous practitioners, thinkers, knowledge keepers, leaders talking about Indigenous evaluation. Um, and, and one of the things that really comes out is that this work takes time. It takes more time than people expect because it is fundamentally about relationship and it's about building relationships in a different way. And so one of the stories that I wanna share with you is um, one of the projects, uh, one of the really exciting projects that I got to work on and walk alongside started back in 2014. And this was a time where I was just finishing my master's. I had just stepped into my PhD. What a great time to start a new full-time role. Um, <laughs> but uh, I couldn't resist because of uh, this project. And it was called the one, it still is called the Winnipeg Boldness Project. Um, and so that's a link that we'll share with you as well. Uh, this project began in 2014 as a community driven, actually it didn't start off that way. So I have to say it was uh, funded as an initiative to support increasing um, school readiness for children in the North End of Winnipeg, recognizing that if a child enters kindergarten um, ready to, uh, ready for school that this uh, impacts uh, indicators you know across their lifetime and and has uh, cascading effects so that was the impetus of the initial uh, funding for that work there was four of us who um who started working on this project the project director diane rusin who is still a fierce leader uh, for that project i was invited in by diane for, as the research and evaluation director uh, and then we had a community engagement manager and a communications person. And we started that initial year. Diane, give her, like, she's been been doing this work uh, in, in community for so long, said, actually, thank you for the funding. Uh, we're going to do this project in a different way. And so right from the outset of the project, uh, she said, listen, we've been, and, and I grew up in this community as well. We've been in this community for so long and we know how to do this work with community. So funders, there was multiple funders at the table, you can trust us to do this project in the way that actually will produce positive outcomes for, with, for, by community, um, or you can find another team. So <laughs> uh, that, that, that was an initial shift in the conversation and um, kudos to the funders, they were willing to trust the leadership um, within this work and to try something different. It was it was framed at the beginning as an innovation project. And so we were innovating right from the beginning. Um, in that first year of resetting and saying, okay, well, what actually is important for um, the community, uh, North End community in Winnipeg, which is a large uh, indigenous and newcomer population, um, what do those families feel is important so that their kids have the opportunity to thrive, not just survive, but to thrive? Um, because school readiness is only one metric. Uh, and, and was it important to the community? We, we learned in the end, education actually is super important to the community, but in a different way. And so we started right from the outset saying, okay, well, let's, let's define what this project is going to look like then. And we spent a year, uh, if, if you want to use, uh, you know, Western, very familiar uh, terminology of needs assessment, we spent a year in needs assessment. But what it actually was, was a year of relationship building. It was, um, even though all four of us on the project were familiar in the community, had done work in many different ways, that didn't mean that the trust that we had with in, in doing this work could be transferable. We had to build those relationships because this project was new and because communities were used to projects coming and going, being implemented, piloting, piloting in and then disappearing and asking for all of this information and then never to be seen again, that whole helicopter research um, aspect. And so we had to build trust and that took time. And so we spent a year building relationship. And what that looked like uh, in terms of community engagement all of the reports are on the website. You can find um, those reports there. But it was really a, um, an interdisciplinary, because that's what I uh, do, approach to, to, to listening and listening deeply. And so some of the things that we did is we invited community leaders, families, parents with small children, 
um, teachers, knowledge keepers uh, into conversation circles. And we listened and we said, what is important to you in your community for your families? And so we had hosted conversation circles. We went out to community events and we um, had activities for the families to do while we sat and had conversations, really informal discussions, getting to know one another. What is this project that we were involved in? What is Winnipeg Boldness? And at that time, we didn't have a lot of answers because we were still building it. Diane talks about we were building the plane as we were flying it. Um, and, uh, and so we went out to community events. We hosted... Um, uh, a photo voice project, actually. So uh, in in the fall of that first year, um, bringing in an arts-based focus, we really wanted to, um, to, to listen to story in many different mechanisms of story. Uh, so we asked um, the community to, to participate in this photo voice project. And so over a series of three months, um, I, I recruited and met with and did some um, training around photography. We um, shared the research questions that the, that the focus was on, and, the, and that was basically what's important for you and your families in, in the north end of Winnipeg. They went out, they took some photographs uh, in response to those prompts, came back, shared their photographs, ha had a series of questions that we went through asking about the photographs. And then we met as a collective circle where the photographers, the community photographers, um, shared their stories. And so this um, was initially intended to be a, a um, not only a, a story, uh, story witnessing uh, method, but also a way to transform um, the broader city of Winnipeg's understanding of what it meant to live in the North End, because the North End of Winnipeg has a really stereotypical, challenging reputation. Um, and, and one of the goals that we started to hear within the project is we wanted to shift this. We wanted for the community of Winnipeg to see that um, families, the North End, the community are strong, are resilient, love their children, want nothing more than to have a space and opportunity and structures um, that support them in ways to thrive. And so that photo voice project, we, um, it was an exhibit. It was an exhibit that was created. Uh, it was installed. Um, there's some beautiful photos on the website. And then the community photographers were interviewed and there was media interviews, that exhibit, that installation traveled all over the city. And the people who, um, were those community photographers that I want to stay involved. I want to keep being involved in this work. I'm so excited. And so that was great because one of the other elements of um, community engagement in, in the planning for the Winnipeg Boldness Project was the creation of guide groups. And so these guide groups, um, there were four specific guide groups that were created, which are still actively involved. And so I have to tell you nine years later, this is pretty significant outcome. Um, is that the four guide groups were, first of all, this initial parent and caregiver guide group that started with the community photographers, and it's since kind of evolved and expanded, and there's more um, who have been consistently directing um, the, the work of the project since the beginning. Then there is a community leaders guide group, and so these are, are leaders within different organizations in the North End um, who hold some really valuable community knowledge and, and ways of working in community. There is a knowledge keepers guide group. So these are um, indigenous elders who um, represent the diverse indigenous experiences in Winnipeg uh, as a guide group, and then a research and evaluation guide group because I couldn't do this work alone. <laughs> this was a massive project. And so they supported me as a community of practice really. Um, and then uh, with the uh, with the guide groups, like I said, those are ongoing. And so, for example, the community and um, the community parent um, and caregiver guide group, they are, um, they not only inform the direction of, uh, uh, of that, the rest of the needs assessment uh, or the listening, the deep listening for the next, for the year, for the first year of the project, they also then started to help me with um, sense making, with data analysis. What does this all mean? How do we prioritize this? Uh, does this make sense to you? What else do we need to know? 
And so they started to help in that way. And so then they started to build capacity to actually be um, out and being the, per the people who were having the conversations, uh, implementing the surveys, doing the data collection, um, and, and bringing them back to the group. And so in thinking about um, the work that the, the guide groups to do, really about priority setting, informing, capacity building, uh, one of the main goals that I had in my work is to leave all of that knowledge and experience and skills behind so that they could then do this work on their own um, in community around research and evaluation. And um, like I said, nine years later, that is, is definitely a reality in how that project continues to function. So when I think about, you know, some of the priorities of Indigenous evaluation of um, relational accountability, shared decision making, data sovereignty and ownership, those, um, those guide groups are a key mechanism through which those, um, those principles are enacted. The other um, story that I wanted to share was really about um, using different methods of engagement for uh, for working with community. So like I shared, that photo voice project was one of them. And the guide group said, this is amazing. What are we doing next year? And so the next summer, we spent the summer learning about uh, another question that was important to them. And we uh, created a tile mosaic of um, a map of the community that had squares that each of the community members um, created art and artwork that uh, responded to that question. And so that art piece is a, a living witness to the work that was done um, and to the stories that were shared as a result of that knowledge gathering, story gathering process. And then the third year, they actually um, completely drove uh, the plane in this instance and they created and implemented um, a, a community priority setting project around creating a star blanket. And so star blankets are really important um, artifacts within many indigenous cultures. Uh, if you haven't seen one before, I encourage you to Google it. It's a beautiful creation uh, that has a lot of teachings around it, around the creation story uh, and around uh, the important roles that we hold within our communities. And so um, they created a star blanket that was a community collected and curated story about what was important to them for their families. And so um, uh, uh, providing the, the resources to uh, engage in a meaningful way is a really critical piece when I think about Indigenous evaluation, asking for participation, asking for input, asking to participate um, requires resources. And so I talked about time <clears throat> and now resources. And so meaningful engagement means that you resource people to show up in a way that values and recognize, recognizes the context within uh, which they're contributing. So the guide group, for example, um, every time they came to an event, they were not only compensated, but there was food and there was childcare and there was transportation because those are all needs that needed to be met in that time and space. And so that was just a fundamental way of um, engaging with community in that time. The other uh, opportunity for meaningful participation and engagement is listening to um, listening to the needs and priorities in a way that you know celebrates the work that uh, community is contributing to so for example not only uh, was community involved in those guide groups and and resource to show up in a good way they said this is awesome i really want to make sure that we have we celebrate the work that we're doing so we hosted um, different seasonal gatherings so for example around christmas time the guide groups um, plan and execute a community Christmas gathering where uh, families are welcomed and come and celebrate and build those really strong relationships within the community. So that's another aspect that I wanted to share in terms of, of how to do this work in a good way. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there. I could share stories for so, so long and that's only one of the projects that I've worked on, you know, since 2008. So. Um, so I want to stop there and see, Heather, if you, you wanted to uh, prompt any questions, and then we can go into Q&A.
Yeah. Thank you so much, Gladys. And I know everyone here can now see why the level of excitement is so high because that it really is some stories about one project. So there are, I highly recommend that you dig into the links that we're going to share with you because there's a lot of really, really good learnings to share. And, um, I have a number of questions and there's some in the chat, uh, but before we kind of go to the chat, can you, can you talk with me a little bit about, um, one of the things that I really like to do in talking data equity is talk about the questions that people in, when they're at work, don't feel comfortable asking, um, because they're afraid that the question is going to be the wrong question and, and, uh, and expose like ignorance or vulnerability. And so one of the things that I really noticed um, that you didn't talk about in your story was you never said anything like, um, this percentage of the people that were involved in the photo voice were first nations or indigenous and this, this percent wasn't. And, um, one of the things that I've seen starting to happen a lot in, in when people start doing projects, whether it's evaluation or just needs assessment, I don't mean just needs assessment, needs assessment or evaluation, um, needs assessment is very challenging. Um, and you know, they've heard somebody like you talk and share these really interesting ideas. And so they say, um, well, we want to try and adopt, uh, an indigenous perspective, or, you know, we want to try some of these ideas. Uh, and then they get either pushback or worry from colleagues that say, well, for instance, here in Toronto, we're trying to redefine homelessness in a way that is less settler colonialism. So that the evidence that we get is not just like you know, long story short, I won't go into the whole thing, but yes, like you are trying to get a better definition or conceptualization of what does it mean to be homeless so that we can have better evidence, design, design better programs that don't just replicate colonialism because they're based on this colonial idea of homelessness. So the pushback is, um, you can't use indigenous evaluation if everybody in your project isn't indigenous or isn't first nations because that becomes cross cultural appropriation. And, and I've really spent a long time reading some of the work that you've done about cross contexts. And so, um, but what would you, what, what, you know, what is, what are your thoughts around these tricky situations? I have so many thoughts. So first of all, <laughs> um, first of all, then, then, then the standard of Euro Western um, uh, creation then becomes the norm. And why does that have to be the norm? Like that's that's the fundamental question for me. What does that make the you know when we think about? I have a very um, intense critique around best practices because best practices are are um, created from a Euro Western um, framework and understanding of what success looks like, et cetera, et cetera. And this is that same thing. So if we are implementing a way of doing something or a model or an approach um, that is uh, the way things have always been done, then nothing is going to change. <laughs> And so um, in thinking about some of the values within Indigenous evaluation, they're also say the same values if we took a decolonial um, approach. And so decolonial and Indigenous work, I, I would say, are very parallel processes because what it is that we're working towards is a transformed future. And if we, if we use the same kinds of considerations, for example, um, that you're, you're coming up against in terms of those questions, um, then, then nothing is going to change. Uh, so what if, uh, you know, Indigenous worldviews actually had something to offer that was really important about how to do things differently? And so I'm not saying that the questions around you know, cultural appropriation, et cetera, don't need to be asked. They do need to be asked. Like who is involved, who is prioritizing um, is are really important things to, um, to do your homework on. And also when we think about decolonizing the future, it's about 
it's about trans disrupting power structures and and that doesn't have to inherently be from an indigenous foundation it's about it's about showing up as a good ally to make sure that things are different um, in, in how we're doing this work. So I, I'm not sure if that's uh, exactly how I wanted to share that, but I, I just wanted to bring forward that question. So then why are your Western perspectives the approach that are the standard? You know, it's um, quite the assumption that's made um, about what is best for everyone. Um, maybe Indigenous perspectives are, you know, would offer us a, a much um, different and equitable future if we actually considered implementing decolonial and Indigenous worldviews um, into, into the work that we're doing. Thank you so much. I really, really liked that idea. And so um, I really like the framing of decolonization or deco decolonial methods and indigenous methods being parallel tracks leading towards the same goal. And I also loved the pointing out that as long as we're moving forward from a space where uh, kind of Western reductionist ideas are like the default methodology and everything else has to be justified we're still in the same old, same old way of making meaning, right? Like that's not, um, yeah, really, really loved that. Um, and I, I'm going to ask one more question <laughs> just because yeah, I, for sure. uh, I was very, very, cause I was thinking about this quite a lot when I was reading the, um, the Winnipeg boldness work. And you answered my question when you were telling the story, which was the group that had been offered the, the funding said to the funder, well, we'll take your money, but if we take your money, we're going to do this with it. That's non-negotiable. You can give us the money or not really, really like this. Um, we have tried some similar things with varying degrees of success from very successful to very unsuccessful. Um, and with the definition of being success, being gotten the money. <laughs> um, and so, cause of course now I'm realizing that's probably not the definition of success that I want to use. This is what I realized as I was saying it. Um, but the question is at any point, did that funder say to you, how will we know if it's working? Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and what did you say? <laughs> well, watch. So um, one of the other uh, innovative um, aspects of that project in particular was that there was a, uh, there is a stewardship group where the funders are sitting at the table. And so funders right. are at the table mm. with community leaders, with the project director. And so there's mm. that shared space where um where they agreed that this is going to be a space of learning together. And so there was there was a um, an agreed assumption of risk. Uh, you know, the the um, it mm -hmm. is it is risky. Innovation is risky. And so uh, we sometimes pushed uh, a, a little bit farther than the risk tolerance went. And sometimes we needed to have um, you know, we really worked from a, a space of consensus where uh, where are we willing to go together? And we recognize at the beginning, and, and Diane Rusin is an astute leader who really, really is strategic in her thinking. Um, so recognize at the beginning, like we don't have to go all the way in this risk right away. We can show through the work that's being done um, that, that this could be successful. And one of, honestly, I was just, I'm, I'm starting a new project um, with Native, Native Child and Family Services in Toronto. And we just had this conversation yesterday. One of the success metrics is that community members are showing up. Simple, yep. that's it. Because yep. of our experience in communities. And so that's what we shared. Like, look at how many people are starting to have conversations with us. This is who is interested in talking with us. And so that was one of the very first pieces that we shared. Like. This doesn't necessarily happen for new projects in this community. That's not right. how this works. So, 
Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's very, very helpful. I appreciate it. Uh, we have also a few more questions in the chat that I will ask, but before I do that, are, are there people in the room that wish to un, uh, turn their microphones on? And uh, if so, just raise your hand. Uh, and the way to raise your hand on Zoom is to look kind of probably at the bottom of your screen at something that probably says reactions. It's probably a little round circle that might have a smiley face with a plus on its head. And then you can raise your hand there. If not, you can just unmute yourself <laughs> and start talking. Just turn your mic on. We've enabled it that you can do that. So anybody in the room want to use the microphone? All right. While you are considering that, let me amplify a question here from the chat. Hi, Gladys. Thank you so much for sharing. I was wondering if relations towards animals and land has come up during your experience in evaluation and if so, how? Ooh, great question. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So it does in varying uh, ways. And when I think about some of the work that I'm doing with different projects and organizations, some of the challenges that we're seeing as indigenous communities, peoples, nations, is as a result of that disconnection from indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing, worldviews um, and, and from our lands. And so um, that comes up often in, uh, in thinking about programmatic level uh, outcomes. So for example, I worked on a, a project um, in Winnipeg that was uh, the Sacred Moon Circle. Um, and that sacred moon circle was in particular focused on reconnecting Indigenous youth. It was an after-school um, educational program for, um, for youth in high school to support them to, um, you know, strengthen their relationships within the education system. And also the elders who were leading that circle knew that one of those elements to be able to do that is actually reconnecting Indigenous youth with cultural practices, with their relationship with um, with lands and with um, the, the overall ecosystem of, of what it means to be connected to the land. So, so plant relatives, animal relatives, et cetera. Um, so in that space, participation in ceremony, participation in, in uh, learning teachings, um, they, they closed off that project um, with time around the sacred fire with the Indigenous youth sharing stories. And so connection to land is often um, an aspect of program delivery that then also comes up in, uh, in the evaluation as a result. Great question. And thank you so much for sharing. All right. We have one another question uh, that's in the chat, which says, thank you, Gladys, for spending time with us today. I am writing from the United States with a question about making or remaking contact with the, and then it says, quote, First Nations people in our public health catchment area. One of the things that's happening is that we are using a federally mandated term, again, reminder, there's persons in the US, um, a federally mandated term, American Indian. We are getting feedback that this term is inappropriate for us to use since we are not American Indian. I would like to start a conversation in our public health catchment area about a better name to use. However, feel unequipped to even start the conversation since I don't know how to address the people I would like to talk to. <laughs> okay, Gladys, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is this is a challenge. And so I teach um, uh, since like about 2008 I also teach in social work classrooms and mm, um, oh. this yeah so this is a challenge that we talk about in terms of social workers preparing social workers to work with indigenous uh, peoples and communities and um, most often in that course we talk about we have to start with the history 
a more holistic history of Canada because that's often, you know, left out in um, classrooms leading up to this space. And right. that means that in the Canadian context, we're talking about the Indian Act. And um, we, so, so the Indian Act, it forms a relationship between the government of Canada and First Nation, Métis and Inuit peoples. And it very specifically talks about um, Indians. Um, of which I am one, <laughs> according to the government of Canada. So, uh, so through that definition, it talks about that relationship. And I know that in the context of learning down here in the U.S., I, I've been based in Washington for five and a half years now, and I was in Baltimore for two years, in learning about uh, naming and and how um, similar, you know, f uh, federal imposition of what it means. Uh, what their their relationships are because um, there there's that box that we are continually put in as indigenous nations and and how to define and make sure we understand exactly how many and who is indigenous. So what I tell uh, students in that classroom is is first of all at an individual level, um, ask. <laughs> So if I were to go to my community and talk to some of the oldest elders there. Uh, they would say that they they will call themselves Indian. Someone in my generation, so mid 40s, uh, would most often start to call themselves uh, First Nation. For a while in Canada, there was Aboriginal, um, and and that was kind of pushed aside. Um, call themselves First Nation, um, and then more and more now you'll see people calling themselves by their nation like yeah. i am a chicago in a new um swampy cree and so that goes down even further sometimes i call myself indigenous it depends on the context and so it's important to understand that naming varies depending on the person depending on the community and depending on the context of the conversation when i want to talk about um uh, my relation to something that is like broad or outside of my community that looks at like broader indigenous rights, broader indigenous concepts, I will use indigenous because that's what people understand um, in terms of sovereignty and, and, and nation sovereignty. So this this is uh, a really, really long-winded foundation to, the, to what I'm about to share. So it depends. Um, and, and I think that if you were to do some research um, around which nations are particular to the area that you're working within, that would be a really good starting point. So what are the tribal nations called in your area? Uh, there's a website called triballands.ca, I believe. I'll, I'll sh remember to add that so that we can share it afterwards. Um, but you can actually, it's an interactive map where you type in your zip code and you can look and see who the tribal nations are that um, are related to those lands. And it actually takes you to their websites if available as well. And you can do some really good learning um, based on that. So who are those nations that are around you? What are their, their names? And, and scroll through their websites. What are they calling themselves? Um, what are, you know, you could reach out to a communications person, um, who may or may not have time to talk to you about it, but may direct you to another person as well um, in thinking about this. And so doing that pre preparatory research around whose lands are you on? What are their websites saying? What are some of the links from their websites taking to you and looking at what are some of the names related there? Always within the context that it changes and it depends. And so asking and having that conversation is important. And also, I'm not surprised that you're getting that pushback because American Indian is a very old term that um, denotes a particular relationship, but it's one that public health continues to use. Uh, I was um, a research coordinator at, for an Indigenous research institute here in Seattle and really deeply involved in clinical health trial um, administration for a couple of years. And, and I just couldn't get past um, the terminology that used within that data relationship within the federal government. So um, it's a challenge. Thank you, nativeland.ca. I hope that helps. I know it's not a, it does a, help. an easy answer. <laughs> yes, uh, you can't see it because it's being private chatted to me, um, okay. but the it there is a huge thank you and some a bunch of happiness emojis because <laughs> that was great. 
Awesome. Uh, and, th and thank you for putting the native land uh, link here in the chat. That is great. Well, we are almost up, but great. Go ahead, Jessica. Hi, ladies. Um, so I, I wanted to follow up on something that you said earlier. Um, you said that maybe um, if we add indigenous perspectives, we could generate more um, equitable evaluation results. Um, as someone that has very, very little um, experience and knowledge about indigenous perspective, how would you, um, what would you recommend for me to do um, to start, you know, considering them, um, starting to get familiar? Um, and I don't know, maybe you can like give me also an example of this, like of the difference between a colo colonial um, approach versus an indigenous approach. Because um, I'll be, I'm being very honest here, I'm not familiar at all with indigenous perspective. And that's something that I, um, I feel it's a, a lacking on my knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. So we will we'll definitely share some links that will be helpful for you as well. There's an Indigenous evaluation bundle report that talks about um, really fundamentally what are some of the values and principles that we need to talk about when we're talking about Indigenous evaluation. And so the other piece there I wanted to just make really clear is that Indigenous evaluation should be uh, driven by, for, and with Indigenous peoples. However, allies, groups who are interested in supporting a different way of doing things can take a decolonial evaluation approach. That doesn't, um, so Indigenous evaluation, the bundle, there's a whole bunch of questions in there for you to consider when you're thinking about working with Indigenous communities in evaluation, including um, whether you're the appropriate person to lead that work or not, and what you do about that. But what I'm saying is that there is a space in decolonial evaluation for everyone. And so thinking about uh, what are the values that are guiding your work and why those are important, that's a very fundamental beginning question uh, when we're looking at both decolonial and indigenous evaluation approaches. So for example, um, if relationship is an important principle uh, to your work, how is being in good relationship, informing all of the decisions that you make, including who is involved, what are the evaluation questions, how are decisions being made, how is analysis happening? And so that's one of the things that I would offer you in thinking about how this work is done different. It's driven by values and principles as the starting point. And those are those are not things that are like on a wall and then never to re be returned to again, but rather they are, um, continual re critical reflection points back to, okay, we're making this decision. Let's look at how we say we're going to make decisions and let you, let's use that framework um, to make very clear and explicit this approach that we're taking to decolonial or indigenous evaluation. So um, I hope that gives you really quick uh, enough of a starting point from where to begin. Well, that's a, such a good answer. And um, I will say um, that I put a link here in the chat to Gladys's uh, website. If you are just going to start in one place, I would listen to that podcast. That podcast is a really gorgeous blend of um, practical, theoretical, conceptual examples, all told in a way that just makes you breathe out. So I would highly, I cannot, I, I cannot overemphasize how good of a place that is to start. The other thing I'll say is that even before we start like filling a lack or getting educated, I had to learn because I was very conventionally Western trained mathematical statistician um, so when I first started learning about like indigenous evaluation, like my habit of thinking was, um, I'm either doing this, like object, I'm doing objective statistics or I'm doing indigenous based statistics, or we're doing like, you know, conventional evaluation or objective evaluation, or I'm going to find a way to like add some indigenous flavor to this. And I, that was the first thing that I had to stop thinking like, because no, no evaluation, no mathematical project 
is being done in an objective way. It's all being done in a way that centers a specific set of values. And um, Gladys, what I hear you saying is get really specific about what the, those values are, but objective is not one of those values. You are not allowed to say objective because it's not, it is mathematically impossible if you're doing quantitative work and qualitative work, it's, it's everything you read about quality. So, so um, when you're saying, you know, indigenous or it's not indigenous or objective. And that was really one of the first things I had to learn. And, oh, great. And Gladys is already adding, um, cause we do need to end on time. Um, some fabulous, fabulous um, suggestions, great projects, great books. I'm gonna add one more link to a PDF of a paper that I've read many, many times um, with Gladys and a few collaborators about um, a specific project that was kind of, it shows you step-by-step um, a decolonial approach and indigenous approach. I don't want to, I don't want to characterize the paper with yeah. the author of the paper here, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're doing good. <laughs> it's really valuable in terms of the question of like, what does this look like? What does this feel like? Um, and, and these, these, all these links really show you that rather than tell you about it. So, mm -hmm. um, we do need to leave it there because we want to respect um, everybody's time. I know in part, oh, great. And a couple of AI note takers joining at the last minute. Um, okay, sorry, I had to pay attention a second to get the note takers out. Okay, so we have left you with lots and lots of resources. Uh, if you do have a little bit of free time, I know some people have a lighter schedule today uh, in some parts of the world, I would highly recommend that you uh, click on one or two of those links, uh, a guaranteed value. And um, so thank you so much, uh, Gladys, for joining us, for spending time with us, sharing your experience, listening to our questions, really, really valuable. Thank you for the invitation. This was wonderful and so happy to, to share anytime. Great. I am very happy to hear that. And uh, for everyone who came and listened and is applauding in the chat and sending thank you messages in the chat, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming and being part of the community. Uh, we will be back uh, at 12 noon Eastern time. I know the time change did mess up a few people. So um, the Zoom link never changes for this event. So if this is your first time here and you'd like to come again, the Zoom link stays the same. And uh, we will see you next week. So take really good care of each other and I will see you soon. Thanks, Gladys. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.